Okay, so we've just listed all our derivatives of our trig functions that we're going to be using in this section. We verified the derivative of sine is cosine using the definition of derivative. Now we're into the example stage where we're going to just start computing derivatives of things involving trig functions and um, in the next set of examples we're going to do a bunch of limits involving trig functions. So let's go ahead and look at this first one. Differentiate 1 plus tan over x minus cotan of x. So what is the derivative? Well, we have to think of how this thing is built up. 1 plus tan of x. x minus cotan of x. That's built up as the ratio of two functions. So we're going to use the quotient rule here. And I'm going to not try not to do everything all in one step. I'm just going to apply the quotient rule and see what it tells me. It tells me it's the derivative of the top function. So it's 1 plus tan of x. That thing is multiplied by the bottom function, x minus cotan of x. And then I'm going to take away from that the top function times the derivative of the bottom function. And all of that is over the bottom squared. Notice I didn't do too much in this step. I just applied the quotient rule. I didn't even pay attention to what the top function and the bottom function were in terms of computing the derivatives yet. I'll leave that to the next line. Here I just noticed quotient, okay, went through the quotient rule. Through the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, all over the bottom squared. Now we can go ahead and compute the derivatives. This is now where I pay particular attention to what the top and the bottom function actually were. Derivative of the top function, derivative of 1 plus tan of x. Tan of x derivative is secant squared of x. And then I multiply by that by x minus cotan of x. Take away 1 plus tan of x. What's the derivative of x minus cotan of x? Well, derivative of x is 1. The derivative of cotan is cosecant squared. Ah, but it starts with the C, so it's negative cosecant squared. But there's already a negative out front, so those two negatives would combine together to give me a plus sign. And all of this is over x minus cotan of x all squared. And there we go. There is our derivative. Okay, how about the next example? Find the points on the curve at which the tangent line, or the tangent, is horizontal. So what does this mean? Tangent is horizontal. What does it mean for the tangent to be horizontal? Um, well, in terms of what we have been discussing in calculus, this is exactly the place where the derivative is zero. So the derivative is zero. That's what we want to find. Where is the derivative of zero? Oh, that means we need to start with the derivative. So okay, we'll start with the derivative. What is the derivative of this function? The derivative of cosine of x all over 2 plus sine of x. Well, that's a quotient, so we'll use the quotient rule. It's the derivative of the top function, which is negative sine of x. Derivative of cosine is negative sine of x times the bottom function. Notice I am kind of doing it all in one step here, but that's really just because the only functions that appear are cosine and sine, and those derivatives um, are right at our fingertips. There's really, um, those are the things that should, should be almost uh, immediate reaction when you see a derivative of cosine should be negative sine right away. Um, so it's the derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. What's the derivative of sine? That's cosine, so there's a square there. And all of that's all over the bottom squared. We can simplify this a little bit. I get a negative sine x times 2, so that's 2, negative 2 sine x. I get a negative sine x times a sine x, so that's negative sine squared. Oh, but there's also a, a negative co squared, so it's minus sine squared minus co squared, and that's equal to negative 1. And this is 2 plus sine of x all squared. So there's our derivative. Once we have the derivative, now we can figure out where the derivative is 0. Where is the derivative 0? That's precisely where the numerator is 0 and the denominator is non-zero. 
Notice that the denominator is always non-zero, though, because in order for it to be zero, sine of x has to be negative 2. Sine of x is trapped between negative 1 and 1, so there's no way it's going to get out to negative 2. So this is just going to be where the numerator is 0. Where's the numerator 0? Well, that's when sine of x is negative 1 half. So when is sine of x negative 1 half? For what x values? This is where you know, a unit circle diagram comes in handy. So there's our unit circle. And we're looking for sine of x being negative 1 half. Sine of x is the y coordinate of a point on the unit circle. So there's our negative 1 half there. Maybe I'll write that a little bit bigger. Negative 1 half. Actually, I'm going to blow up my circle a little bit more, because otherwise it's going to be too small to write these things in. So there's my unit circle. There's negative 1 half. And so there's our two points on the unit circle whose y coordinate is a negative 1 half. The corresponding angles we're looking for is that angle there and this angle here. And for both of those angles, we're going to need to know the reference angle. The reference angle is what you get when you look at the, so in this case, you know, our, our triangle is really this triangle with a half here flipped upside down. So our reference angle is really that angle there where the corresponding uh, opposite side is a half, and our hypotenuse is 1. What's our angle? Our angle is going to be pi by 6. So our reference angle is pi by 6. That means our two angles that we're looking at are this red angle here, which is negative pi by 6, and our green angle here, which is pi plus pi by 6, or 7 pi by 6. Now, I've written them on two different lines like this because there's infinitely many x values that satisfy this. These are our two basic ones, but there's also any multiple of 2 pi added to that. So 2n pi plus 2n pi. So or x equals that, where n is any integer. So we've got infinitely many solutions to this equation. What are the corresponding points then? We know the x-coordinate of the points on the curve now. Now we can find the pair, the x-y pairs. x is equal to negative pi by 6 plus 2n pi. We plug that into the function to get the corresponding y values. It, cos and sine are our two functions here. They're both 2 pi periodic, so we can essentially ignore the 2n pi because it's not going to change anything. What's cos of negative pi by 6? cos of negative pi by 6, so that we're looking at the cosine of, or the x-coordinate of this point here, and that's going to be root 3 over 2. So we've got root 3 over 2 as the numerator here, and that's divided by 2 plus sine of negative pi by 6, or 2 plus negative a half, or 3 over 2. So this thing, if you simplify it down a little bit, it'll be root 3 over 2. So there's our y-coordinate. The other point that we have is the one corresponding to 7 pi by 6. So that's plus 2n pi. And you, ver you evaluate the function at 7 pi by 6, and you get negative root 3 over 2. And so there are the points where the tangent line is horizontal to this curve. There's infinitely many points, infinitely many points. So n is any integer. All right, let's look at the next example. A, ten foot, a ladder 10 feet long rests against a vertical wall. Theta is the angle between the top of the ladder and the wall. And x is the distance from the bottom of the ladder to the wall. So we've got a vertical wall, we've got a ladder resting against it 10 feet long. We've got an angle of theta between the ladder and the vertical wall. And we've got our distance x here. We know our ladder is sliding away from the wall. The base of it is, so it's moving in that direction. That means the top of the ladder is moving down the wall. If the bottom of the ladder slides away from the wall, how fast does x change with respect to theta when theta is pi by 3? What does that mean? How fast does x change with respect to theta? What are we interested in? The change in x 
relative to the change in theta. What are we interested in? Well, we're interested in a derivative, dx d theta. That's what we want to find. Okay, so we've now interpreted what it is we want to find. We're wanting to find a derivative. We want to find a derivative of x with respect to theta. That means I better know a relationship between x and theta. If I want to find how fast one thing is changing relative to the other, I need to know how they're related in the first place. So how is x related to theta? Well, there's a right triangle here. Theta, x is the opposite angle, 10 is the hypotenuse, so that's a sine relationship. So sine of theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Or in other words, x is equal to 10 sine theta. There's our relationship. We want to find the derivative. So dx d theta is equal to the derivative of 10 sine theta. That's 10. Derivative of sine is cosine. So there's our derivative. We, in particular, want to find the derivative when theta is pi by 3. That's 10 times cos of pi by 3. Cos of pi by 3 is a half. So this is 5. And what are our units? Our units for our derivative. Now, so there's units in the question, so we need to find the units of our derivative. Well, the nice thing about using Leibniz notation, this is one of the reasons why I love using it all the time, is it tells you immediately what the units are. You look at Leibniz notation, and it's the units of the variable on the top divided by the units of the variable on the bottom. x is the variable on top. That's measured in feet. The angle is measured in radians, so this is feet per radians. So how fast does x change with respect to theta when theta is pi by 3? At a rate of change of 5 feet per radian. Okay, so the, those were three examples where we looked at finding the derivatives of functions that involve trigonometric functions and using those uh, differentiation rules that we have for trigonometric functions.